Hi there, and welcome to Inside Quantum, the podcast telling the human stories behind the latest developments in quantum technologies. I'm Dr. Stephen Thompson, and I'll be your host for this episode. In previous episodes, we've talked a lot about how quantum information underpins quantum computing, communication, and cryptography. But increasingly, researchers are beginning to use the language of quantum information to describe all sorts of other phenomena in many-body physics and thermodynamics, and gain a whole new insight into fundamental processes that seem, at first glance, very different from quantum computing. Today's guest is putting these building blocks together and working on the quantum thermodynamics of computation itself. It's a pleasure to be joined today by Jake Schreireb, a PhD student at the Technical University of Vienna. Hi, Jake, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Stephen. It's my pleasure to be here. So before we get into the details of your work on quantum thermodynamics, let's first talk about your journey to this point. And as is tradition, let's go right back to the very beginning. What first got you interested in quantum physics? That's actually a very uh, like straightforward answer for me because I remember it very clearly. Um, so I was around 12, 13 or something, like in a like intro chemistry class. Uh, at school and we were doing uh, electron orbitals like mm. so you know you learn about these like s shells and p shells and so on and i was like particularly like this p shell it looks like a figure eight right and i was like no way like <laughs> why is that that shape like this is crazy and i remember asking my chemistry teacher like why why does this have this shape and she was like well I mean, there's all sorts of answers I can give you, but like nature just made it that way. And I was extremely pissed uh, by this answer. <laughs> Perhaps a recurring theme we can get into is how I have been a bad student, <laughs> like pissing off teachers and lecturers and stuff like this. And anyway, um, other guests have said that they did not grow up in the internet generation, but I certainly did. So like after the experience, I just went home and like Wikipedia had like the electron orbitals. And the first thing you see is like these funky words like, as a move to the quantum number or stuff like this. And I was like, well, what is this word quantum and what is this as a move to the word and so on. And, uh, you know, Wikipedia has all these hyperlinks and you can just like click from one to another. And like this set me off on like this phase of like, oh, what is this and what is this and learning from one quantum concept to another. And uh, as a result, I just developed a like deep curiosity about this like wild uh, scientific, like, um, for me, it seemed like this frontier of unknown stuff, like, mm. uh, at least that still is very, um, ongoing and active as a research area. And, and I, I wanted to, to learn more about that. So after that, I st started to look into more stuff like that, read some books, like Feynman's pleasure of finding things out was like very influential on me. Just like science aside, just someone who, I felt lived their lives wanting to travel the world, get to know people and do science with these people. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be a very resonant sort of modus operandi of how to live life. And uh, then, yeah, later on in uh, high school, I was uh, very uh, lucky to meet uh, a local researcher, uh, Andrei Shvirep, who I shared the same uh, surname with, but who is not related to me and who is sort of the first Maltese quantum physicist, you can put it that way. He's an optomechanics guy. And at the time he was still postdocing um, in Belfast, but he was like switching between Belfast and Malta, starting like a visiting professorship there. Mm -hmm. And we'd sort of meet like once every two months to, to discuss quantum things. Cause I, I had just bumped into him and told him about my interest. And I, I think he appreciated that there was someone who cared about this stuff. And I started giving bo books to read and, and stuff like that. And so I got a bit of this like, head start into into being interested in these th these types of, of ideas. Then later on in my undergrad, I uh, whilst in Malta, there there is like really not much of, in terms of like uh, course material that you can take related to, to quantum stuff. There's only two, like a basic intro to quantum mechanics and then like a, a quantum optics course in the fourth year, but there's like no quantum info. Um, I was able to go to uh, two of these so-called squid summer schools organized by Lydia Del Rio and Nur Nuria Nurgaleva um, at ETH, um, both of which were, were very um, impactful on me. Um, firstly, because it showed me that there's like a really large community of people that are, you know, looking to, to work on these very many different questions uh, across quantum theory. And then I had went back the following year and there in particular, 
um, Hendrik Filming, actually I think postdoc here in Berlin for some time, gave uh, an intro lecture on quantum thermal, and that really like set me off. Like I was like, this is this is some cool stuff, you know. I, I guess you hear the word like demon <laughs> in a physics context, and yeah. you're like, what is this? So more or less, yeah, that was the journey. I think it's quite striking that. I guess some of the most influential things you mentioned there were one was Wikipedia, which, you know, open source community driven knowledge. And the other was these squid schools, these summer schools aimed at kind of getting people into the field. It's, it's kind of nice to hear that, that those initiatives work. Yes. And especially coming from Malta, you know, like, so like something like Wikipedia, super important for a Maltese person. Like when I was like 16, 17, I remember like going to like the main university buildings library, for example, mm -hmm. and trying to find books on quantum mechanics and like, you you couldn't even find like a book like Sakurai there, you know, like, uh, mm. and so if there's such little like tangible resources, but then the internet gives you access to anything, then uh, all of a sudden, like you've democratized the ability to start to learn these things, at least on your own, like, uh, and then something like the Squid Schools, I mean, I can, I can definitely say like, uh, they had these like supporting bursaries, like they give you some money, which enables you to like, uh, you know, be able to live in Zurich for four days. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I got one of those and that was like super helpful. Um, and like I said, like if in Malta, it was just me um, and this professor I could talk to and, and like maybe some like older master student that I could talk with, then you go to Zurich and there's just, like 80 people and you meet people like, I don't know, Renato Renner, Scott Aronson was there the first time I was there. And like you, you see that like it's it's a worldwide community of many people. That stark difference sort of tells you, hey, like there's more out there, and it inspires you to make that leap. So I definitely do think that we all should do our part to create these types of inclusive opportunities to to support people from diverse geographic backgrounds, even uh, to join in in this quantum fund that we all have. Um, whether that's like if you get a paper to peer review with bad English from some country and you're just a bit sensitive to that, like you're not going to dismiss it just mm -hmm. because it has bad English, but maybe you help out. Or if uh, there's a master student looking to intern in your group, um, maybe you consider, hey, they're from this this like country which doesn't have so much access to, to doing research in this topic, maybe I should consider them. Um, I think that's extremely important and something that a lot of PIs can do to make a difference. So you mentioned there Malta being, I guess, under-resourced in terms of science. Yeah. Does this come from, is this historical factors? Is this like cur current sort of government priorities? You know, what, yeah. is, is there a reason? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 these are like, of course, complex questions, so mm -hmm. I can only give my opinion. But um, I think, of course, there are historical factors. So like Malta has only been its own country for 65 years. We were a British colony and, and colonized by other people before that. Mm -hmm. Um, and as a result, like, like, let's say you compare, you know, right now we're sitting in Berlin or I work in Vienna. These are places that have been doing, you know, real uh, physics and, and hardcore research for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And in, in doing so, you develop a research culture that, that has spanned those hundreds of years. You develop funding structures and so on. And so if we've only existed as a country even for 60 years, then that's very different. I, I'd say we've only been doing physics as a country, like as a people for like 30 years properly. That's like why we only had our first quantum physicists like 15 years ago. Mm. And, uh, and that is a, a striking difference because, you know, I guess it's just not clear for a, a Maltese person growing up that they could even aspire to do something like that, right? So that type of visibility or giving people access to these types of opportunities is, is very important. A, a larger or broader question is then like, how does scientific funding contribute to this uh, problem presently? And is there things that can be done uh, to change that? Mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer here, but at least I can flag the problem, which is that if these countries like I don't know, Germany, Austria, like bigger Central European countries and, and other countries like them um, that have such a leg up on smaller countries um, get the lion's share of these major European grants. Um, like I can tell you statistics like, for example, in a given year, Germany applies for 350 ERC grants uh, starting. And Malta, since the start of the ERC, has only applied for 33. Wow. So there's an order of magnitude difference across the number of grants we've applied to 
since the beginning and mm. that Germany applies for in one year. Mm. And we only got one ERC starting grant so far as a country. Um, so I'm just like, these are just statistics. People can look them up. I'm not saying I know the solutions, but clearly like there, there is an uphill battle for these countries that have only been doing science themselves for such a short time. And unless there are initiatives to support people from these countries, they are going to be isolated and, and marginalized scientifically. And I think science is one of these beautiful endeavors that we do as humans, and we learn about these amazing ideas. And somehow, as scientists, we have access to understanding these, these beautiful things. Sort of the same way, I don't know, artists really understand a painting or something. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I think it is our duty to like make sure that there is as much access to these beautiful ideas as possible. And so we should all try to work on making that access very equal and equally distributed. Yeah, yeah definitely. And we'll come back to your career in a moment, but that's maybe a good point to to mention. You've been involved in organizing a lot of, uh, sort of summer schools and, and kind of workshops and things in, in Malta, despite the fact that you're at a, a very early career stage. Is this the reason? Is this completely? To... Yes. So uh, I feel like I've had extremely good uh, luck as a Maltese person, like say going to these summer schools or Andrea being young enough, uh, Andrea, my undergrad supervisor, being young enough at the time as a like senior postdoc, not busy yet to give me that time or a number of such opportunities that, you know, allowed me to, in a sense, or in my master's, I was able to do half of it in, in Dublin with Steve Campbell and John Gould. Um, and now I'm in Vienna, so I've had extremely good luck and, and I'm in uh, su such a good position now. I feel a, a responsibility to try to to foster more opportunities for people there. And the the thing I can do is sort of bring people together, maybe get some money from a sponsor or something to, to create something like a summer school in Malta. Because if you bring 80 PhD students and a couple of really cool visiting lecturers and maybe even some people from startups like we had um, at Calypso um, a year ago, then this can be a very inspiring um activity event for Maltese people. Um, I can really tell you examples of like, there was this CS undergrad, like 19 year old guy came over, um, he participated in our basics track and, and the hackathon where he placed second. He did another quantum hackathon after he had no quantum knowledge before this. Um, since then took like um, quantum units in, in his undergrad course. Um, this year he went to a summer school at the ICTQT and is like totally into quantum cryptography now. And we, we've never had anyone from Malta into quantum cryptography. So if we can do more and more of that, it's great because you're giving people, like I said, from these diverse geographic backgrounds, more access to the type of fun that people like us have, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that's super important. I think there's an interesting point in there, I think, in terms of if you make these things accessible and you and you sort of get one person so for example you got into into quantum yeah and then you're kind of paying that forward now yes. you're getting more people from alt and then you know hopefully that's just going to grow exponentially yes. so all it really takes is that little bit of effort and the right you know right person right place right time for sure and then it can yeah just one hopes one explode hopes. <laughs> nice so you mentioned there uh you did your master's half in in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? Why did you choose to go yeah. there? So, I mean, being from Malta, uh, somehow you have to be aware of the game of science a bit uh, ahead of other people. Um, because it's not like, you know, I mean, there's no PhD funding in Malta, for example. So, I mean, unless you decide to do a PhD not being paid, which mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend to be to anyone. A PhD mm -hmm. is a job and you should get paid for your job. Um, uh, you have to be aware of like, okay, so there is a bit of a game here. I want to get employ employed maybe in a good group. Okay, but like good groups probably hire already from other good groups. So like there's a bit of a game here. Mm -hmm. So even this, if you come from a smaller country, unless you have done some amazing stuff, like, I don't know, maybe you have extremely good grades and maybe the professor of your local university knows someone and so on. It's very hard. So I was maybe a bit too aware of this at the time. Um, and uh, basically... After I finished my my undergrad thesis, I decided, look, I'm going to take the summer and instead of like taking it off, I'm going to like start working on some master's uh, research um, because basically the people at the University of Malta were like, OK, dude, like you can do two things, right? Yeah. Like, either you go do two years to do a master's somewhere else in the EU, mm -hmm. um, which can be very financially demanding, especially for someone who has to like 
basically leave their home country, which is an island, right? Like it's yeah. not like you're in Central Europe, you can just take a train or something. Um, or um, they were like, you can do a year here, you will have no taught classes, but like we'll let you do whatever you want, write up a thesis and we'll give you a master's in research. <laughs> and I, I was like, okay, well, I feel like I've, I've done decent enough in like undergrad research. I actually like the research more than sitting for classes, so maybe I should like double down and see how this works. Mm -hmm. And so that summer, I was able to get some like really preliminary results analyzing the thermodynamics of a particular quantum algorithm. And uh, basically, I just started emailing people. So like, I emailed Steve Campbell, I emailed John Gould, and I emailed Nico Fries from the Vienna Group, actually. And uh, they were all very kind to me and, and quite interested to hear about what I was doing. And I suggested, hey, look, I have this research. It would be really, really cool if I could... Um, spend some time in your group just to learn from, from the people in your group. Because in Malta, I only had access to one or two people who are very busy because since our faculty is so small, like uh, the professors end up having to teach three, four courses a year. So they also don't have so much time. And thankfully enough, um, John and Steve were both very interested and we were able to apply for a, a, a Malta Council for Science and Technology grant, which allowed me to go over there um, with some some money, and also I, I got a local scholarship um, in Malta, which which helped uh, during that time. And as a result, I was able to spend some four or five months um, across Trinity College Dublin and University College Dublin, um, learning from these two groups, which was tremendously impactful. Because, like I said, I went from being around two quantum people I could talk to to basically something like twenty five, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it was I, I can't even put into words how like just so much of a difference it made uh, to me uh, scientifically yeah mm. i think there's a i guess a lesson in there for anyone about being proactive and not being afraid to yeah. reach out because i certainly it's not something that i would have done at that stage of my career i would have been just too afraid i wouldn't have known how to how yes. to approach these people I, I wouldn't have even thought that that would be an option i thought they would just you know senior professors are probably not going to be at all interested why would they give me any time and yeah. I never really considered doing that but obviously it's worked out for you it's yeah. worked out for other people there's definitely a lesson in there yeah. about being proactive yeah. identifying and, and maybe if like emailing a PI is scary or you think they won't re uh, reply like find a postdoc that like does stuff which is similar enough to what you do mm -hmm. and they would like totally be interested in talking to you and, yeah uh, I yeah. think that's something I've, I've learned now after a few years in science scientists do want to talk about their work yeah. so if you show some interest in it they're probably going to take that opportunity to to talk about it right they're not not so likely to tell you to get lost for sure but yeah it's definitely definitely an interesting uh lesson in there i think so i normally ask people if they weren't doing their current job what else would they be doing but it sounds like you've had a very kind of single-minded focus on this for a very long time mm. is there any other career that you've you've entertained along the way or is yes, this just totally. yeah <laughs> So I, I've had a very single narrow-minded focus, true, but I kind of for some time had this like dual uh, dual life a bit because like for three years out of the four years I was an undergraduate student, I ran this educational tech startup in Malta called Learned where we used to connect university students with like younger students that they could tutor basically. Mm -hmm. And I mean, of course, this is an idea which has been done elsewhere. It's not like particularly novel, but it was important in the educational context of Malta because there wasn't so much one-on-one uh, -on -one education going on. And I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the prospect of solving a problem by working with other people and building something towards it. It's very, it's a lot like science. Mm -hmm. It's just the types of problems are different. And uh, I enjoyed that a lot. I felt that it gave me a lot of confidence and communication skills in terms of like, I don't know, like raising money for a startup or something. Like if you can do that, then it's easy to email a PI, you know, like so. So that that, def def that definitely helped. And I, I entertained like doing similar stuff like that. And um, ultimately what made the difference for me was like, what do I want my day-to-day -day life to look like for the next five years? And what type of skills do I want out of it? And for me, I wanted my day-to-day -day life to look like learning about quantum information, developing those skills, being able to answer quantum questions for the rest of my life, be that towards building some sort of startup or uh, doing things in academia and like building communities around research in academia. So um, that's ultimately how I made that decision. I think, again, there's, there's another really interesting thing you said there, which is about 
identifying the skills that you want and then pursuing the path that gives you that. That's something that I've that I've advised people when they've asked me, you know, should I do a postdoc? Should I do a PhD? That's what I usually say is what what skills do you actually want? You know, is it is it the dream of becoming a, a permanent professor or is it a case of, okay, I want to learn this particular thing. I want to maybe have the opportunity to to go to this country, to to learn this technique, to work on this field. I think if you if you know what you want out of a a PhD or a postdoc or something like that, I think it's much easier to to be happier to yeah. actually enjoy what you're you're doing because you're you're always getting something from it. Yeah, for sure. That's maybe a good point then to talk a little bit about your research work. So we talked about your career, um, and you've mentioned that you work on quantum thermodynamics. So what what is quantum thermodynamics? That's a that's a big question, but for our audience who might not be familiar with this, can you break it down for us? Give us a summary of what what are the big questions in quantum ther- thermodynamics, and why is it interesting? Sure. Um, so maybe we should start by outlining what thermodynamics itself is, because it's it's very broad. Mm-hmm. I often like to say it's like the operating system of physics, um, <laughs> like and that. like other other ideas in physics are just like apps on that operating <laughs> system, because like thermodynamics is just the the idea of, of understanding how energy uh, is exchanged between systems and, and how it evolves and so on. And any physical theory needs some notion of energy, mm-hmm. right? Which is just, I guess, this sort of like um, phase space invariant. I don't know how to say them in better English, but it's some quantity which allows us to track the evolution of some dynamics. Mm-hmm. And uh, thermodynamics then allows us to ask questions about where that energy is going. Is it being dissipated in the form of heat? Is there some irreversibility in this dynamics, which we can now relate to um, the increase of entropy, which is that irreversibility and this dissipation? And is any external agent performing work on the system to increase these thermodynamic quantities? And so this whole field started around the 18th century with people trying to understand steam engines like Sadi Carnot, um, Fourier in the army of Napoleon in the middle of the desert understanding cannons and, and stuff like this, and then evolved, right? So it was first this like phenomenological theory of people like just looking out and saying, ah, this should behave in this way. But then people like Boltzmann came along and, and thought about how like, okay, if these gases are formed by particles, we should still be able to to recover these ideas from these particles and came up with a, a nicer theory of statistical mechanics, which is still thermodynamics. And so thermodynamics really is that, like seeing how the constituents of a system exchange for me, uh, exchange energy. I, I'm already preempting myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and so now uh, in the modern era, right, there's people like yourself who want to understand the thermodynamics of these condensed matter uh, situations, right? Like these spin glasses or or so on, these, these chains of, of, of a, a electron spins and so on. But in quantum thermodynamics, there's so many different aspects, but we want to understand the exchanges of heat and of entropy in the context of these lonely physical systems like atoms, mm-hmm. uh, clouds of atoms. And in particular, quantum thermodynamics around 2016, 2017, took a very information theoretic spin to it. So... Uh, entropy is definitely, even in the normal context of bits, related to the information content of some object. Of course, it's also related to the irreversibility of a process that, say, a gas undergoes. But you can also talk about the information which that gas encodes. So if a gas is at a particular pressure and temperature, so it's at a particular energy, you can ask in how many different configurations can that gas be in such that it still has this energy. And that's information. So there is a deep relationship between information and entropy and thermodynamics, even classically. But now quantumly, it gets even more interesting because now the correlations, this information content is more complex. We have things like entanglement, which is now a different type of correlation, which is more complex and and really about the the structure of how the mathematics of, of, of quantum objects works. Um, this non-separability of these uh, quantum objects, which then makes the thermodynamic questions even richer. So if even classically there was this relationship between information and thermodynamics, now we want to understand the relationship between quantum information and thermodynamics. So I would say that's really what the field is trying to do. So it's like classically 
you have this correspondence between the number of configurations of a system and energy, but then, as you say, when you turn on quantum mechanics, now you have this whole extra dimension of entanglement and quantum information on top of that, which gives you, I guess, a richer playground to, to work with. Indeed. So people have done many various kinds of things in this regime, like, for example, looking at these so-called quantum thermal machines, which one can form out of these like uh, very small two-level systems, right, qubits. So these uh, quantum objects, which can exist in two energy states, you can think of, for example, an ion. So you take an atom, you knock off the last electron. Now it's an ion, and there is this uh, sort of like state of this electron, which can be either in an excited state before it almost leaves the atom's electromagnetic um, region completely, or it can be in the ground state where it's fairly localized within um, this, this atom. So you can think of two-level systems in this way. And now you can ask, oh, if I bring a couple of these two-level systems, or we can call them qubits together, and now we do things to them, like we, we hit them with a laser and particular energy splittings and so on, what types of thermodynamic interactions can we see? So maybe these atoms bunch up, maybe they dissipate heat to some environment, maybe they get heat from some environment. And people have looked at forming engines out of these types of situations. People have looked at how measurement, quantum measurement, right? This external um, system interacting with our quantum system, leaking information into it, also has a thermodynamic character to it. Um, and, and just a whole plethora of, of questions. Like, if you have a quantum system, why would it equilibrate, right? It's like mm -hmm. 10 to some finite temperature. Why, what's the relationship between entanglement and thermodynamics more generally? Um, can you make statements about this stuff? What's the thermodynamic work that goes into forming entanglement? And what's the dissipation you get out of destroying entanglement? These are all open questions which uh, are still somehow unanswered. Can you use thermodynamics to quantify entanglement? There's like all these fun mm -hmm. questions that one can, can start to attack there. So what's the, is there sort of a big picture goal of the field? Because these are all very kind of fundamental physics questions. Is quantum thermodynamics uh, a field that's interested in fundamental questions only, or is there any kind of application to, to any more kind of quantum technologies or anything like that? Um, for sure. So there are people that really work on the foundations of quantum thermodynamics, trying to, trying to understand something like, like measurement, for example, from a thermodynamic lens, because measurement takes you from um, you know, a state, which is in a superposition between two quantum um, states, to one which is well-defined, something which is like a thermodynamic impossibility. And like, if you're working in quantum thermal, it then like, sort of behooves you to try to solve this. So there are people... Um, in our group in Vienna, trying to solve precisely this question, or these quantum systems, if they're so funny, how do they tend to equilibrium, for example? Mm -hmm. That's another foundational question. The relationship between entanglement and thermodynamics is a foundational question. But as you point towards uh, quantum technologies themselves are also thermodynamic objects, and we should understand their quantum thermodynamics. And this is maybe a good place for me to mention what I'm motivated by in my research. So things I care about or maybe, let's say, twofold. Like, if you have a quantum computer, right? So a quantum computer, one of the very important things is that each quantum object, each qubit in this computer is isolated and addressable as its own isolated thing. Mm -hmm. But you want to also do operations between these qubits, we can call them gates, which lead them to interact, but without spoiling this isolation between each time step. And this is kind of a thermodynamic problem, no? Mm -hmm. So like, you want these things to interact without interacting so much that they kind of spoil their isolation. So people come up with things like error correcting codes, for example, to preserve that isolation, thinking about it as an information problem. Mm -hmm. But surely you can think about it as a thermodynamic one as well. Mm -hmm. So like if I have some error in some specific region of my qubits, now if I bring some more in and I do this like maybe global operation, now that I've brought more in, I can push the error or the entropy down to these other qubits I brought in. So you can think about error correction in a thermodynamic way. Um, you can also think about the resources behind a computation. So if I do something like a gate on a qubit, right? And I mentioned earlier that we can think about this like as a laser hitting a trapped ion then I'm running this laser for a period of time, for example. So, so there's some notion of a clock there. 
and a clock has some thermodynamic resources behind it, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm expending some thermodynamic quantities to be able to track time. So how much resources do I need to do a computation? Like what thermodynamic resources go into doing a particular computation? And the question I care about quite deeply is if something is hard in a computational sense, so it has like high computational complexity, is it true that it requires more thermodynamic work to do? I think that would be really cool to be able to show this type of relationship that like if something is hard uh, in an information processing sense, it's also thermodynamically hard. Mm -hmm. Kind of like if you have a car and you want to drive a long distance, you need to burn a lot of fuel. Uh, it's not necessarily clear that like computationally complex things are also thermodynamically hard. And this is like, I would say the main goal of, of or, or the main idea which drives uh, what I like to do. That's really interesting. I think there are a couple of points in there that I, I really like. I think one is the fact that you mentioned gates as being like a microscopic process of sort of lasers and ions. Uh, the sort of abstract picture of gates has always really annoyed me. So it's always nice to hear when people talk about them as being physical processes. But yeah, this link between complexity and, and thermodynamic work is interesting. And on one hand, it feels like it should be true. Yeah. Um, but I guess then when you start using words like complexity, there are so many different definitions of complexity and then as you mentioned the, the difference between um sort of quantum information classical information classical thermodynamics quantum thermodynamics i can see that, that question probably becomes quite hard to answer once you enter the, the the quantum realm indeed it's currently i would say very hard to even pin down a notion of complexity that works in the quantum thermodynamic sense mm -hmm. so of course in the context of quantum computation Complexity, you can think about resource complexity, right? Like how many gates are you running? And maybe you care only about entangling gates because they cost more. Um, and so that's a very good measure of complexity in that context. But if I care about like just general quantum operations, so things people might call channels, right? Like this way of going from like one Hilbert space to another and so just thinking about these mathematical objects, um, how do you talk about the complexity of a channel? Like this is a very mm. open question. Um, and uh, one which is not clear and one which we're trying to address, like what's a, is there even a good universal notion of complexity in, in, the, in a quantum context? It seems like it's very context dependent as well, the notion of complexity. In terms of uh, different, different physical setups or? In terms of the task you're interested in. Oh, I see. So let's say I want to, this is work that came out of the group in Vienna by, led by Philip Taranto, who is now at the University of Tokyo. Um, a project in his PhD was showing that cooling a quantum system comes at a cost of three different resources, which is the size of the, let's say, ancillary system you bring in to do a cooling protocol. So like the dimension of a quantum system, the complexity of its energetic structure of this system you bring in, and also the amount of time you allow yourself to try to perform this cooling protocol. Mm -hmm. So in this context, you could see that these are the three resources you care about, and so you can talk about complexity in that way. But if you really abstract, try to come up with some general notion, you start to get lost. I'm fascinated by what you've just said, and I want to ask so many technical questions that are probably <laughs> not maybe, appropriate for the podcast. Maybe one thing I should mention is that quantum thermodynamics right now is kind of very splintered. Or not splintered, but you can really think about it as like there are these kind of different countries that do things differently. Like you can even think of a map of quantum thermodynamics where there are people from like stochastic thermodynamics, people that care about more like classical quantities about like when does this quantum quantity fluctuate, like entropy, when is it going up or down? What type of measurements can I do to measure this quantity? And they care about things like fluctuation dissipation relationships. Like if I'm dissipating so much heat, how much fluctuations can I see in a given quantity? So it's like one tribe of thermodynamics. Then there's like the resource theoretic people that care about these very abstract uh, mathematical objects that tell you if I want to go from quantum state A to quantum state B, what's the thermodynamic relationship between going from A to B? And you can come up with all these nice funky mathematical quantifiers like Rennie entropies and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but this is completely different from these stochastic people. And then I would say you have these like more operational thermodynamic people, which I would say is sort of what our group do. Like, for example, you take cooling and you say, OK, how many swap operations am I going to do to cool this object down? So mm -hmm. these are people who are saying, OK, I can pin down these operations and I can think about the thermodynamics of these operations. And 
there, there are even more tribes. Like you can talk about the condensed matter people that do quantum thermal and, and talk about equilibration, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, mm -hmm. this big, big term of like, why do quantum systems equilibrate? And all these people are trying to get at the same questions from different angles. And somehow this is the beauty of the field, but it's also the challenge the community faces to try to unify together and say, listen, we care about these questions. How are we going to attack them? And uh, that's something which I think uh, all of us in the field should, should think about. I guess even perhaps communicating between these different communities must be a challenge if you're, if you're using different words, different techniques, Indeed. Indeed. different goals. Yeah. And this really you know, starts to draw into the sociological aspect of science, right? That like science is a human endeavor. Mm -hmm. And if you just like, you know, choose to bury your head in the sand and say like, I like these techniques and I'm going to answer these questions. And you never look to your left or your, or your right, your colleague might be doing the same exact thing. And, uh, and you'd be like completely missing that. And so I think we should all try to, I mean, this is another point which maybe brings back to the start of our, com our conversation, like summer schools and these like social um, aspects of science are important, not just to bring people into science, but for ourselves as scientists to do science well together. Because I think we only do science well together if we also like have fun together as a community and like enjoy collaborating and not like, feeding into this whole competitiveness of the game of science maybe mm -hmm. yeah. that's maybe a good question a good point to ask actually as one of the earliest career researchers that we've spoken to you've kind of transitioned from the, the kind of undergrad education to research relatively recently how have you found that transition did you find that you you had to have a completely different mindset to to begin doing research because i think a lot of people who are in the research field probably don't remember that that kind of mental shift that yeah. they have to go through. Yeah, so I, I always like to say that like there is some sort of probability distribution of like suffering and time, <laughs> which is normalized. <laughs> so like it has measure one <laughs> and like where it's peaked is different for, for, for everyone. But like you're going to experience some amount of suffering when you start doing research because I mean, basically it's like being thrown at the deep end of a pool and you don't know how to swim yet. Mm -hmm. Like, especially in these big fields now, like science, quantum theory in general is so vast like if you uh, bring a master student that did even a quantum info like a graduate course and now you're telling them okay let's do this project on quantum error correction or quantum thermodynamics there's just so much literature that they have to deal with and i think in these situations you just have to remember like hey everyone around you started in that situation and they knew nothing and it's completely fine to know nothing and take your time with it. Like in some sense, we have the deep privilege of hanging out with these very nice ideas and we should treat it like that. We shouldn't feel this like, oh, I have to learn this so quick so I can get this project done and get this paper out. Like, so for me, I was always thinking about this. Like, ju I'm just trying to enjoy these ideas, learn about these ideas. Um, if I can learn about these ideas from the people around me, that's even better. So that was like my main motivation to go to Ireland was to, mm -hmm. to hang out with these quantum thermal people, learn quantum thermal from them, socialize with them. And like that aspect definitely gets through through these periods of like just sucks and you know nothing. Because if you can at least have fun <laughs> whilst you're doing that, then that's great. And, and yeah, like I think so many people, I've seen this in people around me sort of, really feel like they can't admit that they don't know something because like i think coming up in these like hard natural sciences we're all most of us are quite competitive and we like to seem bulletproof or whatever maybe because we grew up with that idea of like a scientist but the moment you realize that like everyone is quite dumb and a goofball and knows nothing um they just have been doing it for so long and they have very specialized knowledge now that you understand that like, hey, it's okay to be you, to take it at your own pace and just like have fun, socialize with the people around you, to enjoy these beautiful ideas. And then eventually you'll get a nice idea. Maybe you start to work on it. It will also suck because you'll get stuck. <laughs> and, but then like magically somehow, like you'll be at the desk one day and like randomly the solution will appear on its own. And then it starts to move. So I think just understanding that everyone has it hard and understanding that that's a part of the process mm -hmm. and learning to have fun with it is just the key to making that transition between being an undergraduate student that studies for exams and a researcher that does that research. Yeah, I think I agree. I think there's almost an element of just accepting and embracing ignorance when yes. you go from answering questions that have well-defined answers and then you start doing research where even the questions are maybe not well-defined and it is okay to 
admit that you don't know everything about yeah. everything and all these highly specialized topics that you know it, no one's expected to know everything right indeed i mean also when you get into research maybe like maybe initially you're quite scared of this but then you start to work with like very good people and they say stupid things in front of you and you're like ah oh, okay like everyone is fallible even these like big shot scientists like are all making mistakes all the time they're just okay with it and and they can like walk through it like they don't just freeze up you know and and once you accept that like everyone says stupid things a couple of times a day <laughs> then you you feel fine <laughs> yeah absolutely well, talking of the, the people in science, I think that brings us nicely on to one of the questions that I like to ask everyone on this podcast, which is that physics in particular has for a very long time been a field dominated mostly by white cisgender men. It feels like things are perhaps changing, albeit very slowly, and there's still a long way to go. You're still very early in your career, but having worked in a couple of different countries, well, A, having worked in a couple of different countries, how does the, the issue of diversity in physics look to you? And I guess, B, as someone early in your career, sort of looking at researchers who have been doing this for, for decades and all these different research groups, do you think that things are changing? Does, does, does the future look hopeful or does it look like we're stuck in a bad situation and not doing enough to get out of it? So I, I would be very hopeful because even, let's say, across the four or five years that I've been like going to quantum events and stuff, like I have seen a discernible change. Um, is this true across the board, like within a research group, for example? Because like, mm -hmm. if you're in a conference, you're, you're at a conference, like it's a large enough sample size that maybe like even small uh, effects start to make themselves known. So like, if there are more uh, diverse people uh, in in like in a small percentage in a large sample size, you will start to see it. But like, if you go to a given group, like I, I would be comfortable probably estimating that like three out of every five or like two out of every five physics, theoretical physics research groups are still all men or like all men and one like mm -hmm. female, for example, or one diverse person. And the groups where this is not true, where it's like they hire PhD students 50-50, for example, are PIs that are legitimately taking it upon themselves to make that difference. And I think um, the way forward is people just doubling down on that and more people taking um, that inspiration from these groups and saying, hey, I want to make the environment of my research group more comfortable for more different kinds of people, and I'm going to, going to achieve that by hiring uh, more mm -hmm. diversely. Um, aside from that, I think if we continue to have events um, within conferences, within summer schools, which support people from diverse backgrounds, so I, I really like it when at a conference uh, or at a summer school there are these, like, small small sub events for like people from diverse backgrounds to talk about their experiences and so on and, and feel uh, supported and not alone uh, I, I love to see that and i hope more of it happens and uh, whilst i think as i'm saying like it's, it's quite optimistic we can't sleep on this and also maybe as i spoke about earlier in this conversation we need to treat also different types of diversity mm -hmm. so even geographic diversity and and things like that uh, are things we have to to consider both in the language barrier aspects to people doing science because science is mostly done in English but not everyone learns English equally well, um, and also that it is uh, harder for people from different geographic backgrounds to break into science. So we should all keep those things in mind. Yeah, definitely. I think they're all very good points. Okay, one final question to wrap up with then. If you could go back in time and give yourself just one piece of advice, what would it be? Mm. <laughs> I don't know if it was advice, but like, like I was a very bad student. Like, I, I, <laughs> I, like after the second year of my undergrad, I just basically stopped going to lectures and just started reading books. And uh, uh, so in Malta, we had to do a double degree of maths and physics. We couldn't just do physics. And I did well in the physics, but atrociously bad in some of the maths, like these proofy exams with like 30 proofs where you have to do it all by heart. Like... So it was very demoralizing for me. Like clearly I cared a lot about the subject. I liked maths even. I, I mean, I do quantum info today. I spend most of my days doing like inequalities. <laughs> um, so, so I cared about this, but it was quite demoralizing seeing these bad grades. And the only piece of advice I would give myself is like, hey, look, man, like not everyone that ends up being a researcher has to have a first class honors in their undergrad and like has like such a sterling academic record. Like, like 
if you just double down on what you're doing and you sort of do what you're authentically good at, maybe it will work out. Like if I if I just could give myself that kind of like hug, that's that's the only thing I do because it, it's what happened ultimately. Yeah, I think it's funny how many people their advice to their to their younger selves is usually something along the lines of relax. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't stress too, so much. That thing that's worrying you a lot now in five years time probably is not going to be such a big deal. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think that is a very good note to end on. So if our audience would like to learn a bit more about you, is there anywhere they can find you on the internet or on social media? Yeah, I am reasonably active on Twitter at CurlyCubit. You can find out more about me at my personal website, jakeshirep.com. And please always feel free to DM me or, or email me if there's anything you think would be interesting to talk about or anything that you're interested in that you think I can help with. All right, fantastic. We'll be sure to leave uh, links to those on our own website, insidequantum.org. Thank you very much, Jake Schraub, for your time here today. Thank you also to the Unitary Fund for supporting this podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. It really helps us to get our guest stories out to as wide an audience as possible. I hope you'll join us again for our next episode. And until then, this has been Insight Quantum. I've been Dr. Stephen Thompson, and thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.